All right, so we're going to knock out another Q&A. This one I've been asked before. Years ago, I found that, uh, man, when you start giving people what you think Scripture says uh, about the second question, you, you have to be careful because people really, really, really love their animals. Is that a good thing? Is that an okay thing? How many of you have had great animals that you thank the Lord for, which is another point I'm going to make? Right? You, you, Ed's got five right now, don't you, Ed? You got five. Um, so I want to talk about these two. I, first of all, my first point is um, all creatures are a gift of God. Now, I, we, we could look at Genesis 1.1. Or Genesis 1 and 2, God is the creator of all things. Look at all the Psalms. Look at Revelation 4, uh, which is my favorite. If you look at Revelation chapter 4, go ahead and turn there. Um, my favorite verse on creation. Animals. Last verse in chapter 4. This is a throne room scene. Worthy are you, verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11 of Revelation. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. First of all, I'd like to talk about just pets, animals in general. I wonder how many people who truly love their animals, and I'm talking about Christians too, actually give thanks to God for the ingenuity, the creativity that animals really are. You know, I mean, sometimes you just stare at these creatures and, and you think of the crea creativity of the mind of God. And so I'd like to see it, uh, I'd like to see Christians have that appreciation saying, look, God is, is incredibly creative. And good to give us all kinds of creatures. And some of them we can domesticate and bring into our home and get to know really well. And they all have their different personalities. So this person turned in two questions. Is putting your pet down a sin? And Ed's already answered these, so we could be done real quick tonight. No. And then... Okay, Ed, so Ed can make our sermon real quick tonight. Is putting your pet down to sin? No. Are our pets in heaven? No. All right, we can close in prayer. But Ed, we've got to have some scripture, right? We've got to have, we, we're going to go back to scripture, and we're going to try and, and come up with uh, some scriptural principles on answering this. So when you ask me as a pastor, I think that one of the things that as a pastor, if you look at the book of Titus, uh, you look at Timothy, elders are supposed to be able to teach. Uh, they're to teach God's word, because uh, God's word is our ultimate authority. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. Profitable for correcting and right training and teaching and all these things. But also, a, an elder has to be able to teach with gentleness and patience also. Okay, Even those who he disagrees with. So if somebody's really in error, if I correct them with scripture, 2 Timothy 2.24, let's turn over there for a second. Uh, because if, if God leads you to be a Sunday, a Sunday school teacher or an elder or a children's worker and teacher of women's ministry or whatever it might be, you've got to really think about how you do that. And the Lord's bond, this is 2 Timothy 2, 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth. Okay? So this is for, really, it's for elders, pastors, but all of us teach. All of us, by the way, are counselors and apologists in a lot of ways. People ask us questions. Well, what are, we've got to go to Scripture. And so a lot of these are for all of us. I mean, we really got to have patience for dealing with people. Um, so if you look at, uh, just sit, I'll just give you a verse that we're close to. Turn over one book to the right to Titus. So when, when Paul's telling them to appoint elders in chapter 1, 
verse 9 says they have to be holding fast the word, the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict, etc. So a pastor... So when people turn in questions, I don't know answers to a lot of stuff. So I have to pray and search and read my Bible and pray some more and read. And, and, and so tonight, whenever I give answers, it's not the end of the story. Keep reading. And by the way, if you ever find something or you want to talk to me, I, I'm open. I, I'm in, in the boat with you to, to want to follow God's word. So um, so the first thing I would say about pets is give thanks to the Lord for all the creatures that he has made. He has made some incredible, by wisdom, his wisdom, he's created these creatures that can do amazing things. You start reading about the characteristics of different creatures, their eyesight, their hearing, all these things, and it's amazing. Now, if I said tonight, I want each one of you to talk about a pet that you really loved in your past. How many, how many could, like, oh, I could tell you, this dog was my favorite companion, Went jogging with me. I was going to text uh, Denise, can I put up your jogging buddy? You know, you, got, you have it on Facebook, and evidently people can go on Facebook, I heard, and use it in a sermon recently, right? <laughs> Last Sunday, <laughs> okay? Um, you, you have a jogging uh, buddy, right? And all of us could talk about a pet, and you learn things from them, how they benefited you. Um, people talk about how um, this dog got them through cancer. I'd like to know more about that. Uh, our dog helped our kids uh, grow, <laughs> grow and experience life better. And I mean, all kinds of stories each one of us could tell about our pets. So I thought about some of the pets. I'll just throw you up some. Uh, here are some of the pets I've had. Uh, three dogs here. You know what that is? <laughs> it's a Newfoundland. Yeah. And... Uh, this one I had to get rid of. I was working a lot of hours, a lot of overtime, and this little German Shepherd pup needed a lot of attention, and I was still living at home in my early 20s. Yep, still living at home in my early 20s, and the dog needed a lot of attention, and I'd leave it in the garage. What would get steel wool off the, off the shelf and buckets, and my dad would come home. The final straw was my dad had a big bass mounted on a plaque. And he came out, and in the driveway was a stub of a fish. It was missing its head and tail. I wish I had it today. It would be a great discussion. How many would agree? So I'm thinking about, if you ever see one at a garage sale, a, a big bass, get it for me. And I will, so that was the final straw. My dad said, the dog's got to go. So I found a farmer that had a lot of time and space to to raise that dog. So, didn't have this dog very long. This dog, Blackie, I had two labs. Um, this pertains to my second question, um, or first question about putting a dog down. I had to put this one down myself. We lived in the country, and I hate to say it, we didn't use veterinarians. We should have, I know, I know, but this dog would not get in a cab of a car, or a truck or a car. Yeah, it would ride, it would run the gravel roads next to the truck. It would run miles with my dad and if we were driving somewhere, run in the fields. So I had to put this dog down when it got cancer. I will never do that again. Somebody else is going to have to do it. And then another animal that we had to put down. Yeah, that's me on this uh, stubborn Shetland pony. Um, it got founder. I didn't have a beard then. Um, and my dad had to put it down and he said he'll never do it again. He said that was very tough. And so, we, yes, we, next time, we would, I would recommend, if you're going to have to put a pet down, have a professional euthanize it, put it to sleep. And so when we deal, uh, and by the way, uh, my grandkids have one of the best dogs in the world. I mean, they love this dog. I've never heard growl, Amos. Never heard, um, our oldest daughter, Alyssa, all their four kids love this dog to death. And they can lay on it, everything. And I've never heard that dog. That dog is very protective of all these kids. And so I, let me just say this. I know that you love your pets. And so this question tonight um, is putting your pet down a sin. Let's go to uh, the book of Genesis, okay? Um, the book of Genesis. Now, in chapter 
1 and 2, God has created all things, and He's given mankind dominion. Right? Mankind alone has dominion of stewardship over God's creation. We are the highest of His creatures. And we are to take care of, conserve, be kind, till the land, all these things. That's chapters 1 and 2. And mankind alone, in verse 26 and 27, so after it says verse 25 of chapter 1, God made the beast of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing on, that's on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves. And then he says, I've given you the plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed and this shall be food for you. And we also see that it was good to look at and good to taste and um, all of these things in, in verse 9 of chapter 2 and verse 16, etc. So anyway, all right, so my point is this. Mankind alone is made in the image of God. To take the life of a human being is a capital punishment. Now take a look at chapter 9. We're, we're moving with this question. But first I just want to establish something. Only mankind is made in the image of God. At first, we were eating plants. We come to chapter 9 after the fall and after the flood, and God is setting Noah out, and he gives them the same type of commands. So in chapter 9... God bless Noah and his sons. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky because something has changed. Something radically, I can't get into this topic tonight, but something's radically changed. And every moving thing that is live shall be what? Verse 3. Food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. So now something has changed. We can eat the animals. It means we can kill them. Doesn't mean that we show disrespect and not treat them with respect and just, just do whatever we want. We are to take care and be good stewards and conserve the earth, etc. cetera. Uh, but we can take the life of animals where we can't take the life of hu innocent human beings. That's called murder of Exodus 20, verse 13. But in, in, in chapter 9 here, let's keep reading. Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast. I will require from every man, from every man's brother. I will require the life of man, whoever sheds man's blood. By man, his blood shall be shed for in the image of God. So what is the reasoning for capital punishment before the law is given? Man alone, men and women are made in the image of God. So if it's clear, clear-cut case where we know a person has committed murder, capital punishment is justified. No doubt about it. Before the law is given to Moses. Now, but yet we can kill the animals and we can actually eat them. Now, the sacrificial animals, they killed and they ate them. I know, I know I'm just saying that when we talk about this first question, this putting your pet down a sin, it's not a sin and we're not talking about abuse, but we're, we're talking about usually when people want to put a pet down, it's because it's suffering. It's got cancer. It has uh, bone deformities that they said, you know, with a, with a horse, founder got so bad that nothing could be done. And my dog had tumors. That there's nothing that could be done. And so we did put them down. Why can't we do that with humans? Because we've not give, been given that authority. It is wrong to take innocent human life. War is a different issue. Self-defense is a different issue. But I do not have the right, even when suffering, you saw the text that went out recently about somebody's family member in another state 
the elderly uh, grandmother got uh, Alzheimer's and they had agreed to take their life. And so the husband killed his wife and then killed him. Why is that a terrible sin and wrong? We do not have the right to murder. As bad as it gets, listen, I've seen so many great things. As bad as cancer and dying of some disease is terrible. So many great things come out of -of end-of-life care. Things that are said, relationships that are mended, things that just, even though it's tough, we just don't have the right. So even though I'm saying, yes, it's, it's right to do that as an animal because animals are not in the image of God. However, mankind is. We don't have the justification just to take life. So, uh, I, to answer question number one there, is putting your pet down a sin? I would say no, because of what we have just uh, seen. Um, and with that, I would like to see more Christians thank God for the animals that they do have, even in their death. You know, we, we love this animal, does this, this, and this, and we... But who, who gave, who, who created the animals that you actually love and made them in that way? Yes, we domesticate animals, but the original design of all animals is God. And aren't you glad you get to have animals as great, can we say companions and friends? Not friends, I guess. Well, maybe, I don't know. You have to be careful with our words. Oh, they're family to me. Okay, we know what you're saying, but there is a big difference. And, and, and you want to really throw a wrench in it? If you, if you, uh, would you, you saw a kid drowning, well, well, how's that question? Um, and, a, and a pet, your pet drowning, which one would you try and save? And I've had people say, if there was a yeah, there's a stranger who's, drowning. who's drowning. Even someone that you don't like yeah. drowning versus your pet, who are you going to It's a terrible, hopefully that's a no-brainer. Did you hear the question? Somebody's drowning, (laughs) and your pet's drowning, which one are you going to save? Hopefully you would save the human. 70% of my children would save this. Wow, okay. Well, I I hate to see um, a lot of adults. A lot of adults would be right with that. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, having a high view of mankind, having a deep appreciation for all the things that God has created, and then saying, yeah, it it is not a sin, because you're, you're doing it out of compassion ultimately here with animals. It's just that we don't have the right when it comes to human beings. That's only God's ultimate. He's the one in charge of that. Um, So I I don't like to put a pet down, but I've had to. And you've had to. And that's probably all I'm going to say about that one. How many have had to do this? Raise your hand. Everybody here. Everybody here, it looks like. That's very difficult, isn't it? Yeah. You get attached you have all these memories, and we thank God for those memories that we do have. Now, which brings us to the second question. As we talk about memories, with our animals, that's all we have, in my opinion, as I look at God's Word. Okay? Whereas, if I have loved ones who know the Lord, I don't just have memories now. I'm actually going to be reunited with all those in Christ. That's far different than the pets. Now, if you do a Google search, there are people who say, hey, I reason this way. God knows that you love your pets, and so I'm sure in God's understanding of grace and all of that, that he's going he's to have your pets in the new heaven and new earth. And I'm like, where is the scripture for that? Instead of just saying, well, I just know God well enough, or I just think it's just the character of God. We have no scripture that says that. That would mean your pet would have to be resurrected. Now, your pet's died. We're talking in the new heaven and new earth. I actually heard, let me just read it. If you want to look it up, you can. It just was uh, just like a month ago. Derek Thomas, the sermon is called The End in Sight. It's a really good sermon out of 2 Peter. Because 2 Peter 3 talks about a new heaven and new earth. If you want to uh, fast forward it to minute 33, Minute 33, he says, what kind of new heavens and new earth will God restore? Everything that's in this world is the answer. Everything that God created in Genesis that he said was good, 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 good. I fully expect to see my beautiful dogs 
in the new heavens and new earth. Okay. Okay, uh, that's Derek Thomas. I just want to know the scriptures. And so there are a lot of even good people that I, I like to listen to and have benefited from. If I saw, I don't know Eric, uh, Derek Thomas, but I would just like to say, you didn't give any scriptural references for that. Right? And so in my opinion tonight, the answer on are our pets in heaven, and I want to say the new heaven and new earth, I would say no, but there are going to be all kinds of creatures, all kinds of animals. And think about this. If we were, think about how this would be. Let's just say if you do believe, you know, John Doe over here says, oh, I believe that. And he has a website and he's posted these answers to these questions. And he says, oh yeah, your pet will be. And I'm like, well, where's the scripture? Does, and I would have a question. What about some of these pets I didn't like, maybe? You know, Charlie, I know you might get mad at me, but I really didn't like Charlie. I don't want to have to watch after him in the new heaven and new earth. Right, my, my horse, yes, I have a grandson named Charlie. Okay, thanks, Pam. I think they knew because of the context. Yeah, exactly. Um, but everything's perfected in heaven, right? All of us are going to be perfected. It's, in the new heaven and new earth, there's perfection. So Charlie would be a perfect Shetland pony, even though I want white stallion. So, um, now, I'm, I'm joking here in, in a way. Would that mean my goldfish and my uh, hamster and my, my, my frog pet and my turtle pet? And, I mean, so when somebody says, you're, oh yeah, your animals will be, do you see how weird it could be? Yes, Ed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So Ed said, if it's your will, I'd like to have that. That's a good submissive attitude. By the way, this wasn't a question from you. This person put their name on it. But yeah, a lot of people have this question. And Ed, Ed has the right attitude. Lord, if it be your will, that sure would be nice. So in my mind, is that just the ones you want, though? Or is that the whole list of all the pets that you've had? How many have had a lot of pets? And a lot of different. Some people have all kinds. They have bow constrictors and and, and salamanders, and even cats, you know, and uh, how many of you really love your cats? Yeah, uh, but, but a dog, you come home, and a dog just loves you no matter what. Why do so many people love dogs? Because most dogs, you have a bad day, they're so happy to see you, and you could go out and work in the garage and come back in, and they're just as happy to see you again. Am I not right? Can they really help people psychologically even? Yes, yeah. They can. So I would say this. Give thanks to God for the wonderful animals that you have had and not go to the, I, don't th I think, uh, unbiblical point to say, oh, yeah, they're going to be there. Now, why would a pastor be tempted to tell people that? Because that's what they want to hear. And I, years ago, one person got really <laughs> upset. Seriously, got really upset. Because when they asked me, I said, I don't see any evidence uh, for it. So give thanks to God uh, for what you have. Now, I want to look at some other verses about the new heaven and new earth and take this a little bit further. So second, if you want to write these down, 2 Peter 3, 13, Peter talks about a new heaven and new earth. That's what we're longing for. Revelation 21 and 22 talk about a new heaven and new earth. But the first really references to it comes in Isaiah. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25, but we're going to start with Isaiah 11. And this is why I say, well, there will be animals in the new heaven and new earth. I just can't say by the authority of God's scripture, God's word, that your pets will be. That would mean that they would have to be resurrected, your pets. And we just don't see any evidence of that. We only see humans being resurrected. Right? We get resurrected bodies. We're going to live eternally with the Lord, but I don't see anything else. But God, since God is going to create a new heaven and new earth, like, I like Ed's point of view. Hey, if it's his will, yeah, Ed. If that's his will, hey, praise God that he would um, do that. But So chapter 11, we have this shoot. This uh, little sprig will come up from the stem of Jesse. You, you cut down an oak tree. A few years later, what's happening? These little sprouts. And so... This is a messianic psalm that an ancestor from Jesse 
is going to come and talks about the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, etc. He's going to judge with righteousness, verse 4. He's going to strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. We see that in Revelation 19 and 2 Thessalonians 2, if you want to see those cross-references. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says that Jesus destroys the Antichrist at his glorious appearing. So this text, when it talks about he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked, I think this is a reference to the second coming. When Jesus comes to set up his millennial kingdom, and after that is the eternal state, righteousness will be a belt about his loins and faithfulness will be the belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and the little boy will lead them. A cow and a bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra. A weaned child will run sand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Is that exciting? What's, what do we have? We have a good creation, everything perfect. Then we have sin entering in, and we have devastation after that. Ruined relationships, all of life is affected. We have prisons and diseases and all kinds of wicked stuff happening, right? We have redemption that comes. So this is a, an overview of what we see in Scripture. We have God redeeming, but where are we going? What's, what's, where's it all pointing to? It's pointing to a new heaven and a new earth. And, and this is what I like to, to vision it. What was lost in the fall is going to be what? Regained. He's going to bring the story all the way back around. Because what we see now is not where it's going to always continue to be. And so I, I like to share these verses because we can say that we're going to have a radical view of a coming kingdom in which the lion is not going to divide the little lamb. <laughs> right? Try that today. And they, something's going to be changed in creation. And so these animals will be here. Now, is, is God just going to create a bunch of new animals? Well, that sure sounds like it. New heaven and new earth is, is totally... So, now, there are another uh, set of verses. Uh, turn to the back of Isaiah, the last couple chapters, 60, 65. Verse 17. For behold, I created new heavens, new earth. The former things will not be remembered. Or come to mind. That's what Revelation also says. Revelation 21. Former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing. Or people for gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. Be glad in my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping or the sound of crying. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man does not live out his days for the youth will die in an age of 100 and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought a curse so many people believe that this is kind of like millennium and and the eternal state being mixed together here as he's describing it um they will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity for they are the offspring of those who are blessed by the lord and their descendants with them it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Here it is. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The dust will be the serpent's food, and they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain. So it says it again. So, therefore, I think when Peter talks about, in 2 Peter 3, a new heaven and a new earth, and John is told there's a new heaven and a new earth, what can we conclude? Our pets aren't going to be there. But everything that we love about the animal kingdom and its varieties are going to be there. And let me just close with this passage and this thought. I wish people were that upset about, hey, not all my family is going to be there. And I'm going to be happy. You know, there are some people 
that as far as they're living on earth, they have no other family members that are Christians. You know how hard that is? And what do you tell them? You're going to be eternally happy. How do you know? Because that's what Scripture says. How can I be eternally happy? Because you're going to be in the very presence of God. I can't be happy if I don't have my little puppy there, or my dog, or my horse, or my cat. I just won't be happy. Yes, you will. So if somebody responds, I won't be happy if I, don't, if I know my pets won't be there. Yes, you will. Took a look at Psalm 16, 11. 16, 11. You ought to memorize it. I need to. You got it? Psalm 16, 11. You'll make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. John 17, 24 is a prayer that I pray with every, a ton of people before they die. Father, this is my prayer. All that you've given me would be with me where I am, and that they would see my glory. So that beatific vision, the vision of being in the very presence of God, you will, not, you will have the fullness of joy forever, even if, even if, I'll go so far, even if you don't know anybody else that you knew here. You will be eternally happy. Why? Because you're with the one who actually matters in all things. Is that hard for you to comprehend? Yeah. But that's what it says. I just wish more people would ask questions, and I understand this one because we all have pets, so it's a good question. Many people ask it. But man, we all have people that we know that aren't going to be there. And yet I can confidently say, based on God's word, yes, you are going to be eternally happy. Do you know why? You will understand that God is righteous in all that he does, and he never does wrong even once. Do you believe that? Hang on, do you believe that? Do you believe the God of all the earth does justice and righteousness and he does not sin not even once? You believe that? Then you can rest assured that you're going to be eternally happy. I'm going to be eternally happy because I'm in the presence of God. Well, if there's not golf, I don't want to go. That tells me a lot about what you think about God. If I can't have my motorcycle in heaven, I don't want to go. I know, I know that because you love things here more than you love God. So even though I'm not giving the answer of what a lot of people may like, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be eternally happy. And this, this is what I would say. Give thanks to God that he's giving us wonderful creatures that we get to have as jogging buddies as companions, as raising kids, and all these things that you love about your pet. So, pets, plural. So, I hope this helps. Um, if anything, it's going to help us to reflect on these wonderful creatures. Sorry, I don't have any picture of cats, guys. So, I'm, yeah. Yeah, they're going to, they're going to, the, Could there be what? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. So this one is our, the, right. So let me, let me, our pet, the key here is our pets. There are going to be all kinds of animals. And it makes sense then if, the, if this earth is recreated, new, that we're going to be around all this creation, new creation. Because this is our eternal home. Earth is our eternal home. Right? There is a new heaven and a new earth, and this is where we're going to eternally dwell. It's exciting to me that if God has given me some wonderful pets here that I'd love to look at and enjoy, right? And I even love things that aren't... I've been around some cats lately. I, I'm starting to like cats. <laughs> They're pretty cool, all right? Um, and some people are like, really? Yeah, they are. And there's all kinds of things people really enjoy. I know people who really enjoy snakes. They really, I know you're getting the, you're like, don't even mention it. They really love snakes. I really love owls. And I know some people in church that really don't like owls. But I think they're awesome. They're amazing creatures, right? And I even like buzzards. They are the scavengers. They're the garbage. They come 
collect all the garbage on the roads. And you know what? They're amazing flyers. Just go out on a sunny afternoon and watch them glide th these currents. They're even amazing. I don't know if I want one as a pet, right? They serve a purpose. So, um, years ago, two, May uh, 2008, I had this little blog, and I would just put up uh, pictures of creation. And I was over by Stronghurst, Illinois, and the gentleman owned the horse. He's now with the Lord. I took a picture of this horse, and uh, by the way, it's caring, if you can't tell. Um, so, um, anyway, because he told me that, I wouldn't have known that. I just thought he'd been eating a lot. She has been eating, eating a lot. And this verse out of Job, Job 39, 19. Do you give, ask, God's asking Job, do you give the horse its might? And the answer is no. Do you clothe his neck with a mane? And the answer is no. Who does? God. I mean, horses are incredible creatures. So, we, out of all people on earth, we ought to be excited about animals, right? And to take care of them the best that we can to be good stewards. And we even get to eat some animals. And you're like, oh, I'm going to be a vegetarian. Well, you can be a vegetarian. But it's also okay to take the life of some animal. Genesis, it sounds like any animal. Properly done. Because let's, let's be real here. As I close, I'll really open up a can of worms. What we call domesticated home pets that we love in our country, in some countries they consume these and they also consume the others. Okay? So I'm just saying, we have to put things in perspective. <laughs> I left on a good note, didn't I? And you're like, man, why didn't you share this somewhere in between? So... Now, as always, when I'm answering these questions, I'm trying to answer them the best I can as I look at God's Word. And so, by any means, uh, if you're studying sometime or you run across something, uh, let's look at it together. So, any thoughts or questions as we close tonight? Okay, let's pray. Lord, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You've created so many wonderful, amazing creatures. Some of them we, we can really get to know and take care of. And we long for the day when there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, where righteousness dwells, when the curse is reversed. Help us to long for those promises to be fulfilled. And in the meantime, to be good stewards of what you've given us, we thank you for those animals that we get to domesticate and learn from and have live in our own homes, some of them, and we give you thanks for them. Help us to have a good perspective on all of life uh, based on the foundation of your word. And Lord, it's so encouraging to know that in your presence is fullness of joy. We don't have to fear about being sad. It will be glorious. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.